Okay. So just to um, give you an overview of our um, sessions during the week. So today we're going to start off with the update session. Um, and we've got five speakers to go through key topics in andrology. And these are more sort of factual. Um, and uh, we'll move on to that. We've got two themes uh, during the day. We've got um, sexual dysfunction uh, in the young adult. And uh, we've got uh, some uh, speakers who are leads in their field. You know, we've got Roland Rees, Sucks Minas, and Ian Pierce giving us talks on that. And then we've got the European uh, Society for Sexual Medicine lecture from David Ralph on reconstructive surgery. Um, we will then move on to our joint meeting with the uh, academic section. Uh, and after last year's successful medical legal session, we'll be covering uh, medical legal uh, pitfalls. Okay, so next slide. Um, Tuesday, we've got another joint section meeting with a section of oncology. Um, and there's a new teaching course based on last year's uh, joint session with the female uh, urology section so on prosthetic surgery. Okay. And on Wednesday, again, two teaching sessions and our e-posters. So that's just an overview of what we're doing. Um, what the section has been doing over the last year, we've been fairly proactive. This is our membership of the section at the moment. So Roland Reese was elected as uh, our secretary to the section. Um, VJ, Mike and Raj got re-elected. And we've got two new members, Mark Lucky and CJ Shukla. And Pippa was elected via Surge and Duncan still stays on the committee as a trustee. And uh, we've been quite active in new guidelines um, and also general uh, national policies. Um, the joint uh, vasectomy guidelines, post vasectomy guidelines with ABA and BAS has been now published. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about that in our afternoon session. Uh, we've also been proactive uh, with members from the committee on the NHS commissioning policies as well. So these have been completed for, for surgical sperm retrieval, penile prosthesis, and also urethroplasty. Um, we've been liaising with Mark Speetman and Professor Moran with the trauma guidelines and doing patient information sheets for sexual dysfunction. In terms of audits, well, the urethroplasty one is ongoing, but it's open to the public. It's been open since last year. Uh, but what's new is that we've launched our own national penile prosthesis audit. Um, so this has gone live, and we encourage anyone who's doing penile prosthesis to start entering their data. The idea is that we collect data from the beginning of last year and also prospectively from now. So that opened last month. Um, it's all fairly straightforward uh, to enter the data. A lot of it is already on the patient information form that you fill in when you do an implant. The only additional uh, information that we need is related to perioperative antibiotics and post-operative complications. So it's not exhaustive, but you know, it is important we do collect it. So if you already collect PTNL data or urethroplasty data, you just log on to Dendrite as you normally do. If you don't, you'll need to get a, uh, a password to log on and then start entering uh, your data. Um, and the reason why we need to do this is based on what we found when we did the NHS commissioning policies is that the evidence is fairly poor for penile implants. To get data from the companies is very difficult, so we want to collect our own independent data. And also when we start renewing commissioning policies, and this will benefit us because then we want to try and move away from IFRs when it comes to penile prosthesis and get a central pot of money so that we get more equitable services around the country, um, that we can just present them with this data so we get a complete uh, overview of what we're doing in the UK. And just finally, I'd just like to thank everyone on the executive committee for putting the program together. I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, during the week and the chairs that are going to be doing our sessions as well, and also the BAUS events team for putting the program together. And thank you for attending the first session on Monday. Uh, those of you who are not playing in the football, there is football, uh, 7 o'clock for the charity football, and also, obviously, good luck to the England team tonight. So I'd like to um, ask Mike Fraser, who's at Glasgow Royal Infirmary, to start our update session uh, on recent papers in andrology. Thanks, Mike. Right, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been selected to do your, your CPD in andrology for you. So I've picked 
four papers that have all reached print in the last nine or ten months. They're my choice, and I've tried to avoid overlapping with CJ and Ian and Ollie too much. Um, but I'll, I'll try and tell you why I like these papers and what I think their relevance to andrology practice is. The four areas I've picked are one's about treatment outcomes, which, as I've already told you, is a, a bit of a hot issue. Uh, one on complex penile reconstruction, one on prosthetic salvage and infection, and one on penile cancer. So the first paper I've got was published in the Gold Journal last August, and it's got a rather lengthy, wordy title, which I'm not going to go over. You can read that for yourself. But I think this is an important paper because what it does is try to address the usefulness of the PDQ in the treatment of Peroni's curvature. Now, I'm sure most of you do curvature surgery. I don't know if any of you use the PDQ routinely, but the PDQ or Peroni's disease questionnaires or other for the clinician, it's a kind of lengthy uh, piece of paper with a lot of questions that are broken down into three domains for the patient. One is on pain, one is on bother from the Peronis, and the other one is a mix of physical and, and psychosexual bother. And what this group, it's Wayne Hellstrom's group from Tulane, what they've done is try to look at the usefulness of the PDQ. And what they've done is they've, they've, they've harnessed the, the 800 plus men who were involved in the IMPRESS-1 and IMPRESS-2 collagenase studies and got them to use the PDQ pre- and post-operative to see if treating and improving their curvature has improved the various domains of the, the PDQ itself. And what it, this does, and if you look at this, the, the graph on the right-hand side, what it shows really is that for even for people who've, who are only improved a little bit to through people who are improved a bit to people who improved quite a bit, what it shows is a positive correlation between improvement in curvature and the recorded domains of pain, bother, and physical or psychological symptoms. Now, what impact does this have? Well, this is a paper that should have an impact. I'm not sure if it has had an impact yet, but this is something that we, we should all be looking at. Um, we're all looking for uh, patient outcome measures, patient reported outcome measures, that thing that makes the transition between subjectivity and objectivity and takes that, that decision of whether things are success or failure out of the surgeon's hands and into the patient's hands. In some respects, this paper is, is harnessed a little bit by the, the clinical trial scenario and there probably is a little bit too much of the, the, uh, the clinician bias. Uh, but overall, I think what it does is it shows us that the PDQ may be a, a useful tool to, to use. It doesn't really go into the psychosexual very deeply. It doesn't really factor in the men who, who have ED and what their, their need for ED treatment is. And it doesn't really tell us a lot about shortening. But it's, it's the beginnings of a useful prom. Um, and it's something that I would recommend to you. In, in my practice, I've, I've been using PDQ for a few years now. And, and the difficulty is getting patients to complete them in, send them in, particularly post-operatively. But perhaps the use of the PDQ plus an IAEF and maybe an edits encompasses most of the things that we would need to go. So I'd encourage you to read that paper, at least to see if that impresses your practice. Now, the second paper I've, I've, I've chosen is, is one from Paulo Egidio in, in Brazil. And, and whenever you go to a, an implant meeting, Paulo is always a bit of the star of the show and everybody wants to speak to him. Um, Paulo obviously divides the and, and popularized the sliding technique for whatever you think of it. And, the sliding technique has become so well known and so popular that the patients come in and ask you now, do you offer the sliding technique, doc? I just tend to look at them wistfully at that point. Um, this, this paper published in the, in the, the BGU at the turn of the year um, was, was a big series. This was 143 men undergoing complex reconstruction for length or girth or length and girth restoration uh, using sliding technique without a graft and using an implant. Um, these, these patients were a mixed bag. Some of them were Peyronie's patients, some were post-priapism, some were fibrosis from other causes, whether that be previous hyperspadius surgery, injection therapy. So they were, they were a mixed bag. But on overall, the men had reported preoperatively they had a, a loss of length from their pre-morbid state of, of about 3.4 centimetres. Now, this, this technique relies on the, the, the sliding manoeuvre, which is, is marked on the the penis on the left-hand side of the slide, but it relies on, on that technique plus neurovascular bundle mobilization and some dorsal and ventral 
longitudinal relaxing incisions to improve the girth. Now, this paper produced some startling results. And overall, that the, the mean improvement in length was about 3.1 centimetres. And there were no grafts lost to uh, infection. So this was quite a, an eye-opener. And uh, at the recent Coloplast uh, master class, uh, Paolo again was a, the subject of much uh, interrogation over his, his technique and his outcome. Um, but again, it would reiterate that they're not losing prosthesis due to infection. Um, they don't graft, and partly they do that because that, that increases the time that your, your graft is exposed, but they, they feel that the use of a, a, a graft of whatever sort is, is unnecessary. And when you look at the axial rigidity, it looks excellent and the, there's no bulging. Now, in their, in their report of series, most of the, the patients had malleables, but uh, more recently, they're, they're now reporting on, on patients with uh, inflatable devices. So as you can see from the pictures there, you can see the, the sliding uh, technique performed, a malleable prosthesis in place, and all that's used to cover it is, is the previously mobilized box fascia. Now, what's the, what does this tell us? Well, what it doesn't tell us is we should all be going out and doing this to every patient with Peronis or, or, or uh, ED. But what it does tell us is that the paradigm in managing these patients who require penile reconstruction has changed. And we now have to sit and say, well, perhaps putting in an implant and offering straightness and rigidity is not all that the patients are after. It also tells us that in experienced hands, we can push the boundaries. We've always been frightened about complex procedures, exposing the graft in theory for a long period of time, but it shows that this is possible with the right experience. However, as with lots of things, we would like to see this reported in other series and probably by, by other surgeons. Third paper I've, I've chosen is um, from this year's G. Roll from March. And this is a, this is a revisiting of the, the Mulcahy procedure, the uh, immediate graft, the immediate prosthetic salvage, which was reported about 20 years ago in, in a small group of 12 patients. And then Mulcahy wrote his seminal paper with uh, about 65 patients, in which he reported that uh, washout and immediate re-implantation uh, resulted in an 82 per cent survival rate of the, of the prosthesis without infection. So this is a sort of up-to-date revisiting of it. Again, it's a series of 58, so people might say, well, that's a fairly small number, but whilst this is a horrendous complication for any implanter, I don't suspect any of us really want to see somebody present their series of 500 infected implants. So this is maybe as big as we're going to get. Um, on the right, sir, the, the, the table that always pu puzzles me the most is that it's a list of all the, the, the strange bugs that you get with your infected implant. I suspect that in the US they must have different microbiology labs because I never get a positive culture on, in, on any uh, of my implants. Not that I get that many uh, infected, I must say. Um, so what they've done in this case is, is employ a, a semi-rigid device as a spacer and they've done the, the multi-solution washout that is similar to what Mulcahy said in his paper. Um, of their 58 patients, they revised 17, 17 of them to an inflatable device, I mean, of approximately six months. However, interestingly, 37 of these guys elected just to keep their, their malleable implant. And overall, uh, at follow-up of, of mean about five years, uh, their infection-free rate was 93%. So I think what that tells us is that whilst they, they, we know the infection rates in prosthesis are low, there's still a high attrition rate in these patients. Um, I think what it does say is that the, we can uh, almost now consider immediate sal salvage to be the standard of, of care in these patients, and that uh, explantation and uh, delayed re-implantation with all its problems and fibrosis and shrunken penis uh, is perhaps something we should reserve for those few cases where we have bad diabetes or pus or, or, or necrosis. What we don't know from this if their results are better than Mulcahy's because they've used a malleable device. And uh, again, if we had heart back to patient outcomes, um, why did some of these guys choose to, to keep their malleable? Was it they were a lot largely an older population? Were they, were they just frightened of a further procedure or were they happier? There are other various things to be, to be answered from this, I suppose. But overall, a paper I would commend to you. The final paper I, I'm going to mention to you, I think, is probably the best of them all. And I, I say that with a slight embarrassment as my as the, the, the senior author, Vijay Sanger, sitting on the panel list today. This, this paper is in uh, the, the latest uh, edition of the BGU. And this is a, 
a study which compares a, a one and two day technique for uh, sentinel node visualization and, and biopsy in people with high risk penile cancer. On the slide there is the, is the algorithm that most people would use or slight variations of for, for managing uh, the nodes in penile cancer and for essentially what we'd say for clinically node negative patients where their primary lesion is above a T1, G1, they're going to get their sentinel nodes looked at. Uh, VG group clearly do ultrasound on, on all the nodes. Uh, in my practice, I don't, uh, purely because that adds a, a, a lengthy interval, which I find it unacceptable, uh, but that's purely a, a local issue. What the, what the group at the Christie here have done is they've, they've looked at the traditional two-day protocol where the patient, the day before surgery, gets a, an injection into the penis of the technician-labeled hydrocolide in a dose of 40 megabacrals. Uh, they then get the, the uh, lymph and scintigraphy scan. The node's marked, and the following day they get uh, biopsy in theatre. Uh, they've compared that with a one-day protocol where, uh, other than a dose reduction to 20 megabacrals, it's all injected and done and discharged on the same day. And although this, this uh, one-day protocol has a relatively short follow-up, the, uh, the, I think the figures from this are, are, are very impressive. And uh, 280 groins in 151 patients after a negative ultrasound or FNA. And essentially what they found were uh, they harvested more nodes per groin with the one-day protocol. They were finding uh, higher radioactive counts and therefore able to possibly excise uh, rel more relevant tissue. And probably most importantly, a false negative rate, which they found at 5.1% compared to the uh, just short of 7% false negative rate with their 2D protocol. So I think this is a paper that, that will change our, uh, our practice and it's something that uh, has, has impressed me enough to, to change my practice just since I, I read this two or three weeks ago. Uh, it's, it's clearly very feasible. My original concerns with the 1D protocol was, was having too much background noise and, and difficulty in identifying the abnormal tissue, but I think that uh, VG's group show that's not the case. Uh, the possibility of identifying more tissue to take away is probably relevant uh, with the current technology that we have for DSNB and the, uh, the adverse events, despite taking away a little bit more tissue, are still very acceptable. And I say particularly the, the uh, false negative rate uh, allowing for short follow-up. So these are the four papers I'm going to suggest that you go away and, and, and have a look at and see if they all have some relevance to, to your practice and have a good day. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, we'll move on to our uh, next update topic. Uh, I'd like to introduce CJ Shukla um, from um, Western General Hospital in Edinburgh, uh, who's one of our new newer members on the executive committee, and he's going to talk about low-intensity shockwave treatment for erectile dysfunction. Thanks, CJ. Morning. So we're going to talk about the use of low-intensity shockwave treatment for erectile dysfunction. This is not a new treatment. It's already established in other fields. Our orthopedic and plastic surgical colleagues are already using it for the treatment of fracture non-unions as well as uh, flaps and infected uh, skin ulcers. We don't actually know the exact mechanism of how this works, but it's thought to create a microenvironment that stimulates revascularization and angiogenesis as well as tissue repair. Now, as urologists, we're familiar with the use of shockwave treatment, and we've adopted it since the 80s for the treatment of stones. This is at a higher energy level, 450 bars, but our orthopedic colleagues adopted the new technique in the 90s for the treatment of the bone non-unions at a lower energy level, where it reduces inflammation. And we've kind of lagged behind by nearly two decades in adopting it for the treatment for ED. So how, why does it work? How does it work? What's the rationale? So the frequency resonance hypothesis tells us that if you use ultrasound mod at low energy levels, non-thermal levels, you can actually modulate cellular properties uh, by altering, say, membrane permeability, protein structure, proliferation, and altering the transcription of proteins that may be associated with inflammation and repair. And how does that happen? Well, acoustic streaming and cavitation are what mediate these changes. 
So for those who may not be familiar with acoustic streaming, these are essentially the physical forces of the ultrasound which provide a driving force for movement of small molecules such as ions and organelles. And that's how it probably alters membrane permeability and activates signal transduction and gene regulation. I'll just take you back to your basic science days and you'll see on the top left here, this is the pressure wave of the ultrasound. You have a positive and a negative pressure and that's what creates the micro bubbles that collapse. And the kinetic energy is what is used for the uh, uh, um, movement of ions and molecules. Now the table at the bottom, if I can just draw your attention to it, just shows you that when you have high energy levels, you can use that in a focused, mechanically destructive force, such as in lithotripsy. But at medium levels, it has anti-inflammatory properties, such as those used by our orthopedic and plastic surgical colleagues. Take it to the next level, at nearly 80 bars, you can then harness its angiogenic properties. And what's the tissue effect of this? Well, if you have lithotripsy at high energy levels and you target it on cells, you will get nuclear damage and cell death. But you reduce the energy levels, you alter the uh, permeability, and that's how you get the changes that we're speaking about. So putting it together, we don't actually know how it actually does this in terms of the exact extracellular and growth factor mechanisms. But I'll just take you through this. If you have a shock wave that generates a mechanical response, you'll get your cavitation and shear stresses that cause your intracellular and extracellular physical uh, responses, resulting in endothelial nitric oxide synthase, release of VEGF, and production of PCNA. Now, the clinical response can actually be short-term, such as vasodilatation, or long-term, which is angiogenesis and neovascularization. And this is not just pie in the sky. It's actually backed up by clinical models and preclinical models. So we have mouse models that have showed an increase in vascularity. We have the rat models, which not just show inflammation reduction, but also the diabetic models, which show an improvement in erectile function. Our orthopedic colleagues will use this model, the rabbit model, for the treatment of tendon inflammation and bone fracture non-unions. And there is clinical data in their fields as well. And these are level one evidence. So you've got a couple of review articles here, especially that one at the top by Antonic, where they've taken a number of randomized controlled trials in plastic surgical uh, patients who have had decupitous ulcers and infected skin flaps and showed resolution. And similarly, you have data on orthopedic fractures which have had non-unions and healed in about three quarters of the cases. So let's move on to how it's used in erectile dysfunction treatment. This is the device we use in our unit. Uh, it's uh, not available on the NHS, so it's usually in the pri private sector, but it's the Medispec or the Omnispec device, also known as the ED1000. You have the head here, which is what delivers the shock wave. So in terms of the patient journey, what's involved is that after you've counseled the patient in terms of the process, the efficacy, the treatment starts in cycles. And each cycle gives you 12 treatments over nine weeks. Let's break those nine weeks into three week periods. The first three weeks, they will get two treatments per week, then three week break, and then another two treatments per week for three weeks. This probably demonstrates it better you'll see that the first three weeks, they'll have two treatments per week for three weeks, a three-week break, and then two treatments per week for another three weeks. Each treatment will require the probe to deliver the ultrasound on the penis in three areas, the distal, middle, and proximal shaft, and each crust. And you get 300 shocks per area, a total of 1,500 shocks per treatment, and each session lasts for about 15 to 20 minutes. There are no adverse effects in our series or in published literature series. They do not require any analgesia. There's no bruising, ecchymosis, or lymphedema. Who is it suitable for? Not everyone, just patients with vasculogenic organic erectile dysfunction, both responders and non-responders of PD-5 inhibitors. The clinical efficacy that I quote them based on the few papers that we have is 50 to 70%. And that's based on the erection hardness score and the IIEF. 
There are a number of companies that produce this technology. The Medispec and the Sparkwave uh, machine are electrohydraulic generators, the spark, spark gap uh, principle, and the Storz that produces the Duolith uses the electromagnetic generator. And the Renova produced by Direx uses linear shock waves. You'll see here that the Duolith and the Medispec uh, have a conical delivery system, and therefore the focal zones are quite narrow, whereas the Renova has a linear uh, probe which delivers treatment and encompasses the entire corpus in its treatment. Therefore, the protocols vary as well. I'm not going to go back over the Medispec protocol, but the Renova, which is this linear here, this linear device, uses one treatment per week for four weeks and targets four areas, each corpus and each crust. There are variations in their protocols, so not everyone has stuck to those, vari those protocols. And the Duolith has its own protocol, you can see. Now, this is a busy slide, and I didn't want to give you slide after slide of papers, but I will just navigate you through these slides. These are single arm studies, level three studies, which have looked at their outcome data. There are eight papers here. Three of them have used the Medispec device, four have used the Renova, and just the one that has used the Storz device. Now the initial paper, the first report, came from Israel, from Yoram Vadi's group, and they are now the established name in this uh, technology. But you can see the majority of papers have only just come out in the past couple of years. The technology and the papers in the single arm studies have been short in terms of the number of patients as well as their follow-up period. You can see some of the patients have only been followed up for weeks or up to two months, and the longest has been six months. I'm not going to dwell on these too much, but you'll see that firstly, the erection hardness score improves in 50% of patients, and the IIEF improves in about 70%, 56% as well. And they've also come back and done the same study in PD5 non-respondent patients and found a similar result. Now, that's just single arm studies, but we actually have level one randomized controlled start trial studies that have re reproduced these results. Of the five randomized controlled trial studies, you'll see that four of them have used the Omnispec device, and one has used the Duolith study. Yoram Vardy's group features here as the initial paper and the most recent one, which is currently in press and hopefully will be in the paper version in the October uh, journal, Gold Journal. So, I'll just talk you through these randomized trials. First of all, you can see the numbers vary from low, num low to medium numbers, and their randomization is 2 to 1, 1 to 1, and 3 to 1. Their group have looked at PD5 responders as well as PD5 non responders at the bottom here. And other groups have similarly had the inclusion criteria of mild to moderate erectile dysfunction based on the baseline IIEF. I would say scientifically, the academic side of things, the Vardy group have actually also used plethysmography as an, an indicator of improvement in erection hardness, whereas the others haven't. Overall, you'll see that the outcome in terms of improvement in IIEF is about 56% of patients report an improvement, and three quarters of patients, sorry, two thirds of patients report, report an improvement in the erection hardness score. But look at the follow up again, one month, one, and one to three months. The longest data we have is from the Indian group here in 2015, which is at 12 months. The important thing I just want to highlight is that at 12 months, 83% of their patient had, patients had a sustained improvement in their erection hardness score and were able to have penetrative intercourse, which is quite important. This is in fact not reproduced in the Danish paper by Olsen, who used the dualith. Their dropout rates or drop down rates are from 57% at one month to, as you can see, the pointer is failing me, 21% in the right hand column here at six months. And I'm not sure whether that is down to a different patient population or in fact the different technology that they're using. So overall you'll see from clinical data the effectiveness is between 50 to 70 percent and we don't know whether this is long-term durable or not. So that's where the ifs and buts come in. We are now comparing a bit like the lithotripsy story in stones different machine technologies 
different treatment protocols, different methods of assessment, and therefore different outcomes. We have a relatively small number of patients, and the long-term data are not really long-term. They're up to a maximum of 12 months in only one paper, and the majority of papers are no more than two to three months. Just to give you a, 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 a glimpse as to how trials should be set up and appropriately to give you the correct outcome, this is the Hong Kong group who tell us that in their paper the outcome is that the Medispec device or this treatment does work for erectile dysfunction. But in fact, if you look at the primary and secondary outcome measures, there was no difference. But one of the things they did was a post hoc analysis and showed that only the severe group of erectile dysfunction patients are improved. But they were underpowered. They knew they needed 70 patients, so they only recruited 70. And after a drop off, they only had 58 patients completing the study. There are other variables. You have some groups that use the correct protocols as devised at 3,600 shocks, and you've got the Argentinians who've done their own thing and used 5,000 shocks. And we're not sure whether that has an influence on uh, the degree of revascularization or not, and whether that has an effect on durability of response or not. The focal zone probably also plays an important role here. Lithotripsy, you can see the focal zone is about a centimeter in size. That's because you want to target the stone and not surrounding parenchyma. As far as this technology is concerned, your focal zone is between five and eight centimeters. But does the technology matter in terms of the focal zones? Well, it probably does, because scientifically it's been shown that electromagnetic generators produce a shock wave in their focal zone only. Whereas if you look at electrohydraulic systems, it is shown to also produce shock waves beyond the focal area. And we're not sure whether that actually affects angiogenesis in surrounding tissue beyond the focal zone in the corpora cavernosa. Finally, I've also shown you a linear, versus, uh, linear generator, which is the uh, Direx, or the Renova, sorry. Uh, and we're not sure whether the linear shock waves make a difference compared to non-linear shock waves. So if we're going to actually start using this technology in this country or in Europe, then we probably, and I should not make any Europe jokes today, but in, in essence, we have to standardize the questionnaires that we're going to use. IIEF, erection hardness score, and the CGICS. For academic units, you probably will need, hopefully, some plethysmography to correlate your findings. And hopefully with that, we'll probably be able to standardize our data collections and evaluate patients in subgroup analysis. And then based on that, we will look at favorable and non-favorable outcome measures and hopefully follow these, up, these patients up for longer periods of time. Now that may not be possible, especially because many of these patients are in the private sector and coming back to see us would obviously cost them or their insurance company money. So we've got to look at ways of actually getting around that. And based on that, we can then make a rationale uh, argument, a rationale for uh, a wider uptake of this or not, uh, and the health economics that go with it. I thought there was going to be time for questions, but perhaps maybe at the end or not at all. Okay. okay thank you much, CJ. That's very good. <clears throat> We've got time at the end. We will uh, take some questions, but I just want to move on to our uh, next speaker, um, Ian Erdley, who's doing a protest vote over there. Um, he's going to talk about the sort of controversial topic of testosterone uh, and the ageing male. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Thanks, Asif. Sorry for being a bit late. Um, there we go. I was asked to give a talk about testosterone. I, I, I've given talks here in the past two or three years, but the, I think the relevance this year is that there has been quite a bit of controversy in the past 18 months, two years, about the potential cardiovascular safety of, of, of testosterone in older men. So what I'm going to do is, is give you a gentle start, talk, take you through testosterone physiology, be very familiar to everybody in the room, I'm sure. Um, then move on to the issues in older men, uh, look at some of the benefits of testosterone, and then get, get on to the, the issue of cardiovascular safety. Testosterone from the Leydig cells in the testis is a pro-hormone. Pro Aromatase converts it to estradiol, 5-alpha uh, reductase to, to DHT. 
Uh, within the circulation, it's largely protein bound, mostly to SHBG and is biologically inactive if it's bound to SHBG, uh, but is also bound to albumin and there is some biological activity with that. But the relevant thing is that the free testosterone is the bit with the biological activity. SHBG is affected by a number of conditions which are all listed on the slide which can have uh, an effect therefore upon the free testosterone and the, the ability of what appears to be a total testosterone having any biological uh, effect. Uh, and the other bit that's relevant is what I'll talk about a bit later on with respect to the cardiovascular safety is the issue that testosterone varies during the day. It's high at night and tends to drop during the morning. So in theory, all the testosterone assays should be done before 10 or 11 a.m. in the morning. And when we get onto the cardiovascular safety trials, it's not at all clear actually when the testosterone levels were measured in most of those studies. So with that background, what we know is that in older men, testosterone falls, both total testosterone and free testosterone. The mechanism by which that happens is relatively poorly understood. It's probably at the hypothalamic stroke pituitary level uh, and is associated usually with a normal LH. But, and this is where it gets increasingly complicated, a number of uh, chronic conditions are also associated with a fall in testosterone. And so when you're talking about an older man, is that simply an age-related issue or is it because they are more likely to have these other conditions, such as obesity, uh, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. We know that as testosterone falls, there are progressive increase in symptoms. This is a, a paper Michael Zitzman, who's an endocrinologist in, in Munster, uh, in Germany, uh, produced, which showed that with progressive levels, of lower levels of testosterone, you get more and more symptoms. So uh, quite high levels of testosterone, you can get a change in sexual interest and sexual desire, falling uh, to much lower levels where you, where you get the erectile dysfunction. And in clinical terms, we shouldn't treat anybody unless they've got a combination of both biochemical hypogonadism and clinical hypogonadism. That is, they have to have symptoms. You shouldn't treat symptoms in the presence of a normal testosterone, and you shouldn't treat a low testosterone if they don't have symptoms. You need the both of them together. And there are a number of guidelines that talk about what the, the normal levels are, which I won't go into anymore. But it should be a morning sample, and it should be on more than one occasion. And with uh, those sort of criteria, there's a good level of evidence, both for young men and old men, that testosterone replacement has symptomatic benefits. Uh, in this slide here, what I've tried to do is the, the strong evidence where there's two pluses uh, and there's relatively, uh, the, there's some evidence, but not particularly strong evidence if there's just one plus. Now, to get onto the cardiovascular issue, we've known for some time that men who have a low testosterone have a greater mortality. This is one of a number of studies. This is a lady called Katie Core. She's professor in, in Cambridge, and this was based upon a study undertaken in East Anglia. But the lower the testosterone, the lower the survival over a period of time. This is without intervention. And so it's raised an issue, and this is really the crux of the issue. Is that low testosterone the cause of that, de of that increased mortality? Or is it just a side event? Is it an adaptation to ill health? Because if it's the cause, then in theory, replacing the testosterone should improve survival. If it's a side event, then it should have no effect. And that really, that, that dilemma is at the crux of the cardiovascular risk debate in relation to testosterone. So let me take you through the evidence. So, Firstly, the, the, the basic science evidence, if you look at what testosterone will do, it has a number of favorable effects upon the cardiovascular system. It will enhance endothelial-mediated vasodilatation. It will increase cardiac output by increasing stroke volume. It will shorten the QTC interval, so it will improve, uh, potentially improve arrhythmias. Uh, there's some evidence that it, de that it improves reperfusion and therefore thereby is beneficial uh, in reperfusion injury. Um, it certainly decreases adiposity. People who are on testosterone for a long period of time lose weight. They lose that central obesity. 
and they get improved insulin resistance and probably, in most cases, improved diabetic control if they've got type 2 diabetes. Set against that, there have been a, a number of reports looking at the effect of testosterone replacement on uh, the lipids. There may not be very much effect, but I, I think there's a consensus that there might be a slight rise in HDL. Uh, it does have an effect, however, on red cells and on uh, platelets, in causing a, an increased amount of red blood cells and an increased risk of platelet aggreg aggregation. So there's been some reports that suggested an increased risk uh, of deep vein thrombosis, uh, evidence levels not very good. So that's what's been found in vitro. The clinical studies uh, are I've separated into four groups. The first one is to a degree what we thought we knew. So these were a number of retrospective studies where testosterone was given to older men with a low testosterone. And as you can see, both of them are retrospective cohort studies, so they're not randomized, they're not prospective. And they looked at all-cause mortality. One of the things you'll see is if you look at the, the mean duration of follow-up, you'll see that in these studies and in the studies I'll show you later, the mean duration of follow-up is substantially longer than the mean duration of testosterone treatment, and that's one of the major flaws of these retrospective studies. The second flaw is the indications for the testosterone replacement are not stated and are variable. And the third flaw is that there are different sorts of testosterone replacements. So some people got gels, some people got injections, some people got patches. But what these two studies appeared to show was that testosterone replacement in older men had a survival benefit in terms of all-cause mortality. And that's what we thought we knew. These are the papers that really became very, very controversial. Uh, the middle one, the vegan study, was uh, the one that really hit, hit, hit the headlines. But the first of these was, was a study, and this was a prospective randomized control trial of testosterone replacement in men, older men, over the age of 65, with muscle weakness problems. And this was a study where, so it wasn't being given for sexual problems, it was being given because of muscular weakness in older men. And it was a prospective study, and it was halted early because of an increased risk of cardiovascular events in the testosterone treatment arm. Now, the problem with that study is cardiovascular events didn't just include heart attacks, heart failure. It included rather more uh, softer events, such as peripheral edema. And so that has always been the criticism of that study, but it did appear to show the testosterone replacement in older men had a cardiovascular risk. The next one down was a retrospective cohort study in men undergoing coronary artery angiography. So by definition, these were men who had a higher instance of cardiovascular disease to begin with. Large study, retrospective, and it was a, the outcome was composite of mortality, stroke, and myocardial infarction. Again, as you go along, the mean duration of follow-up was substantially shorter than the mean duration of treatment. So not all these men were on treatment, perhaps even beyond one prescription. But what it did appear to show and what initially it reported was that there was an increased risk of cardiovascular events in the group of men who received testosterone. Now this paper received an enormous amount of criticism in JAMA. There's a whole stack of attacks on it and one of the big problems is that actually the number of cardiovascular events in the men receiving testosterone, the number was lower than in the men who didn't receive the testosterone. And it was by some statistical manipulation that the relative risk was calculated. Uh, the statistics, I'm afraid, are beyond me, but it's, there's no doubt that that's a very, very controversial study. The third study was, again, a retrospective study, different group of patients, again, the outcome being non-fatal MI. Again, the issue uh, of duration of treatment is relevant. But these were men who were assessed for cardiovascular events before and after the prescription uh, of testosterone, and the two time periods were compared, but again showed a potential risk of, of testosterone replacement. So we have a group of studies, retrospective, that show benefit. We've got another group of studies which show harm. So what do the statisticians do? They go on to the, uh, the meta-analysis, the systematic reviews, and two systematic reviews were published with contradictory results. And in theory, they were looking at the same literature, but in practice, uh, they didn't include the same number of trials. So the stop study, the top study, the Zhu study, excluded six trials 
that the Corona study included. And the Corona study included five trials that the Zhu study excluded. So they were using, in theory, the same criteria, but doing it in a different way and getting opposite results. So one showed no effect, one showed harm from test testosterone intervention. So the systematic reviews do not provide an answer to the problem. You'd hope that a prospective randomized trial might give the answer. And this is a paper, uh, a culmination of a number of papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine this year. And it summarizes a series of studies that have been undertaken in North America, whereby you, look, you take seven trials, different indications in older men, using the same protocol, the same sort of testosterone, they all use testosterone gel, with the same follow-up in the hope that not only will you answer the individual questions about benefit for the different sets of symptoms, whether it's physical function, sexual function, vitality, or so on, but by pooling them all together, you might get some answer on the safety side of it. Well, this was the f data is the first publication earlier this year, uh, and it showed that testosterone in a randomized trial improved sexual function, there was no benefit for walking ability, the distance walked in a sick, fixed period of time, and no benefit for vitality. In terms of the cardiovascular risk, this is the numbers of adverse events. Uh, raised PSAs, as you might guess, were seen more commonly in the testosterone, or testosterone treatment. But the number of cardiovascular events were relatively low, and there was no significant difference between the two arms. And certainly the number of events did not allow any useful statistical analysis. So these prospective studies have not yet provided the answer. So where are we? Well, the FDA took a view. They put together a special uh, panel, September 2014, which initially concluded that there wasn't enough evidence to provide any uh, definite conclusion. And a subsequent statement in March 2015 said that T testosterone replacement therapy was approved only for men with documented low testosterone caused by a specific condition, so not the age-related group. And that if you were going to prescribe it, you should be discussing the risks and benefits with the men uh, before starting therapy. So to conclude, testosterone replacement therapy has a clear place in true symptomatic hypogonadism in both men of young and older age. It provides benefit. In younger men with disease of the hypothalamus or the pituitary or the testis, there are no uh, issues relating to safety. But in older men with the age-related fall in testosterone, there is uh, controversy. There is uh, a lot of evidence regarding benefit, but the evidence regarding safety is mixed. It's contradictory and it's flawed. And we desperately need good evidence from proper, powered, prospective, randomized trials. So what do I do? This is a personal practice. In older men with symptomatic hypogonadism and no history of cardiovascular disease, I will use testosterone, but I will counsel patients about the, the lack of certainty about cardiovascular safety. In that same group of men, if they've had a recent cardiovascular problem or within the past six to 12 months, then I will decline to offer them testosterone therapy. Clearly, the sharp people in the audience will have picked out that there's a group between those two extremes where perhaps they had a cardiovascular event some years ago. And in those patients, I find it really difficult. I think the evidence that's been produced in the past two years makes life very difficult. There is a suggestion from imperfect studies that there may be harm from this treatment. Uh, and I think we have to uh, be cognizant of that whenever we see men with a low testosterone in our clinics. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. That was an excellent overview of a very difficult uh, topic. Um, we'll move on to um, Mr. Ollie Kays, who again has come down from uh, St. James Hospital in Leeds. Uh, another one of our previous fellows is going to give us an update on uh, Peroni's disease. Thank you very much, Ollie. Thanks, Asif, and thank you to the section. And yeah, it's a Leeds double act. We share waiting lists and a barber up in Leeds. <laughs> So, um, everybody got their phone and their iPads. We're going to try and make it vaguely interactive. There's a few voting slides in this one. So, if you can open up your app, uh, there will be a, a section in there where you can, uh, when the voting slides come up, you can interact and we can try and get some uh, dialogue going. But just to 
spend 15 minutes on what's happened this year. So the action really, we can see, as with most PubMed um, publication graphs, there's an increase over the number of years. You can see down oops, where Nesbitt published his first paper in 1965. There's been a steady increase in how we report and review this information. And we're getting about 80 to 100 papers a year. Unfortunately, most of that literature is review papers, very few randomized controlled trials. I suggest there's also uh, increased public awareness over the last 12 months to 24 months. Uh, and that's through uh, public um, groups, both patient support groups, national press, uh, and the drug companies helping to drive patient awareness. So this is the app, so if you can go through that, that would be helpful. There's no need to log on, and uh, we'll guide you through it. So just as a warm-up to see who's got their fingers working, um, I think the role of Peroni's disease in general urology is, is clear. Everybody has been trained and identifies disease, but I think there's variability on how you manage it and and how much we pass on to others. So just a quick poll. I'm not a urology consultant, so you could be a specialist nurse or a trainee. Uh, you only know how to plug in the robot, so you're not interested in anything else other than that. I can see cases, but rarely operate, and certainly know how to evaluate uh, and work up cases. I perform about 10 cases a year. I'm actually a subspecialist andrologist working in the field. So vote now. Never has a more banal question had such amazing music. Um, so, the vast majority of you are not actually working as consultants yet, um, but obviously here with an andrological interest. Um, and we can see that about a third are probably dealing with this on a or sort of first uh, visit consultation basis um, and happy to advise on the diagnosis and also treatment options. So what do we know about Peyronie's disease? We know it's progressive fibrosis of the tunica albuginea of the corpus cavernosa. It's a dysregulation of collagen 1 and 3 and elastin and fibrin deposition, and that's predominantly driven by TGF-beta-1 um, uh, molecular processes. The literature reports quite a wide prevalence between 0.4% in older studies up to 6.5-7% in older men. And the four Ds, as I remember it, about a fifth of men have a Jupitron, 70% of dorsal angulations. The mean uh, deviation is 42 degrees, and a third of men will have ED. So they're figures I keep in my head when I'm seeing men in the clinic. And John Marhol's paper from 2006, if you watch these guys for 12 to 18 months, about one in eight or nine will get better. So I certainly want to be intervening in them. Uh, but the vast majority will either stay the same or get worse. So second slide. So in my experience, a typical PD patient worries most about. Now, they come in with a lot of concerns, but do they worry mostly about pain, erection problems, penile size, plaque, is this cancer doctor, a curvature with difficulty having sex, or cosmetic effect of the PD? Vote now. So I think, unless anybody's got a comment from the audience, it's a standout that most men will, will be coming in with the difficulty to actually have sex. But that's not always the main driver for all men. I think uh, in the early active phase, then penile pain can be a significant uh, issue. Um, and, and for some men uh, who don't have a curvature, then the, the arisal of a new plaque or lump in their penis is highly um, worrying. So they have to be counseled appropriately. So there's functional and psychological things. But what do men actually report? So if you take some evidence from 
Uh, Nelson, who's uh, published widely on the psychology of Peyronie's disease, Mahal Levine and the PDQ studies. About one in 10 men have suggested relationships have broken down completely due to Peyronie's disease. 45% of men with Peyronie's disease say their doctor wasn't helpful. 20% of men are worried about being laughed at. 40% of men never had options of treatment actually offered to them. So we can do more for these men. And when you look at one paper from the last 12 months and try to put some numbers to the symptoms. So in this study of 7,000 men in the US, it's putting a prevalence rate somewhere around 10%. So an underreported problem. If you've got Peyronie's disease, about a quarter of men are suggesting they've got a lump. A third of men are saying they have ED. And about 40% of men are saying that they have erection problems. So maybe slightly different to what we perceive of what we're seeing in the clinic of, is what they're publishing in the literature. Only 4% of men actually have some form of treatment. Pain wasn't assessed in this study, but has done previously in actually quite low rates. So I think it's probably a little more, and the bother score is probably worth bearing in mind, particularly with the new questionnaires. So from the AUA, I, I, John Mulhall presented this as a downward spiral of what happens to these men. They get deformity and constraint and pain. Uh, and that's side by side with anxiety and shame, leading to physical and psychological problems. That leads to sexual dissatisfaction. And in the end, a psychogenic sexual dysfunction will prevail, avoidance behaviours become manifest, and that gives you reduced quality of life, depression, and relationship discord. So this is not purely about the penis, this is about the man as well, and their partner. And the literature would suggest 80% of PD sufferers reported emotional difficulties, and half had relationship difficulties, and 48% of men will be diagnosable with depression. We don't go and ask men about their depression scores. We don't use questionnaires. I think this is an area of weakness in our practices. And we, we rarely talk to the partners of the, of the men. And Davis has reported this year of female partners of men with perennial disease have impaired sexual function, satisfaction, and mood, while degree of sexual interference is associated with worse outcomes. So the worse this gets, the vicious cycle sets in and it affects both partners. And this is a summary from uh, some recent reviews in the Translational Andrology and Urology uh, Journal, which uh, has put out 10 reviews uh, in the last month, and I think this is an excellent resource to go back to after the talk and, and get some updates. Um, you can see how the new PDQ scores used in the IMPRESS trials have given us some new information about bother and how that relates to penile curvatures. Uh, where's the support? So I've looked online, I think there's two good websites, one American and one uh, European, both uh, company sponsored, where they provide excellent resources for patients uh, and also doctors. There's been a change in the guidelines published by Chung, which is uh, got a multinational panel on it, so I think they've made seven new recommendations in the uh, Journal of Sexual Medicine, and I think if I was going to look at one other publication, it would be that one uh, this year. PROMS, we've been working on PROMS for f four, five, six years now. Uh, Nick Walken uh, presented a validation study at the AUA. I think we are awaiting some more feedback from that. Uh, and the PDQ, Hellstrom's, originally described the uh, three domains for sexually active men who are having penetrative intercourse. So it does take out men in single uh, relationships who, and men who can't achieve sexual intercourse. So it has its limitations, but it is a new uh, tool for use in the clinic. And I always warn men about blog sites, uh, two that come up as a top hit are the Bent Nail and Peroni's Forum. So. Uh, there can be some skewed information on these sites. I just warn them carefully about where they're getting their information from. So, on to oral therapies. It's a hot potato. Which one to give? When to give it? Should we give anything at all? Pataba has been historically one of the uh, main agents uh, promoted. Uh, tamoxifen, pentoxifilin, vitamin E. Do you use a combination of the above? Do you use something else? Or do you just never bother? 
These are ineffective agents and I just don't think they have a role in my practice. If you'd like to vote now. So I think this message is coming through clearer over the last uh, couple of years. The guidelines from the EAU, AUA, uh, and now the JSM are, are really uh, hammering home the lack of evidence. It doesn't mean that these drugs are totally ineffective, but uh, in a randomized or the limited randomized controlled trials, um, no agent has really been proven to be effective to reduce curvature um, and improve the disease. So there's been some issues around pain, but the vast majority of you would say they wouldn't use anything at all. Um, in my practice, uh, it's rare that I see a man in the early stages of Peyronie's disease now. Often they manage through choosing book clinics. There's a 12 to 16 week wait to get in, and by the time they've actually come through a, a, sec a secondary re internal referral process, um, the role of any kind of medication is, is very limited. Uh, so I'll point you in, in the direction of one review from this year from Ostrowitzki, um, and then there was a, a, a further uh, RCT by Park, uh, and the conclusions are the same. I think if there's any agent that has potential for further investigation that remains pent pentoxifiline based on its improvement in uh, pain, erectile scores, and some improvement in um, curvature, but in isolation, I don't think drugs are really the therapy. They need to be used as a part of the multimodal uh, therapy package using traction devices um, and improved counselling. So we'll take an example at this stage. So a 42-year-old primary school teacher, 12 months of dorsal curvature, 45 degrees, no ED, mild pain, recently divorced, secondary to the problem. His main thing is he doesn't want to make it worse, but he knows he can't get on his life unless things get better. So who would instigate traction therapy? Who would use collagenase injection and modeling? Who would use corporoplasty just using a stitch? Who would use corporoplasty using the classic Nesbit with an excision of tunica? Corporoplasty using the Lou 16 dot? Who would go for a patch and who would use an implant? Now given the number of people in the room, there's hopefully there'll be more than two per. Okay, so based on the experience within the room, the vast majority would simply advise this gentleman towards some sort of corporoplasty, be it with an excision or a simple plication. Uh, the reason for putting up this slide is obviously to do with collagenase. Collagenase has been in and around Peroni's disease since the mid 80s but it's only been licensed since 2013 by the FDA and that's on the back of the Impress 1 and 2 trials. We know that if you can inject the uh, topo isomerases in collagenase into the plaque it will dissolve the scar to some degree and that allows modeling of the penis to help with straightening and the trials in 551 men suggested in their protocol, which used four cycles with two injections per cycle, which is quite an aggressive and lengthy process, a 30% uh, improvement. That equated to about a 19, 20 degree improvement. So you've got to select your patients, and it's licensed for um, Peronis over 30 degrees. But obviously, if you're going to take men with 9, 70, 90 degree bends, you're not going to bend them to a position where they are probably going to have improvement in sexual function and quality of life. So I think collagenase is, is, is limited experience in the UK. Obviously, David Ralph has probably the best experience having run the trials out of UCH, and, and now UCH, I think, has it on the formulary. Is that right, Asif? Are you...? Uh, almost. Almost. So drivers there, but I think elsewhere it's been a harder process. Uh, I would suggest if you're interested in using collagenase, I'd go to the website, sign up for training and simulation, and speak to them. They will obviously link you in with their simulator and also uh, identify a mentor 
business cases are difficult, I'd encourage you to engage early with your uh, NHS and private hospitals. Careful selection assessment um, and marking of the patient is paramount. You can't just have the patient turn up, inject them and expect them to, to just magically have a straighter penis. It's, uh, 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 you do it in the wrong patients, you'll have bad outcomes and if you don't counsel the patient and generate a patient program, they won't do well. Um, swelling is a big thing, pain is a big thing and bruising. So if you talk to the hand surgeons, uh, actually very few hand surgeons use um, Zyaflex. Um, but they only need to put one injection in to start, start bending out the Dupatrons. But they said the swelling and pain probably out, um, was uh, less desirable than actually having a surgical procedure. So it's a different ball game with, with Peroni's disease. I think we need to change our protocols. I inject a week apart, I use a coband dressing, and it's all about the modeling techniques. They have to do that several times a day. Often when they're having a wee, I just ask them to bend their penis over a, over a finger and we'll model it in the clinic as well. Uh, I think four cycles is cost pro um, prohibitive as well. So this drug is 650 pounds per vial. So when you start having eight injections for a treatment, that seems uh, <coughs> somewhat excessive, certainly to our NHS. So case two, I want to finish with. Uh, a 90 degree with some hourglass and um, uh, additional deformity. He's been using sildenafil, hit and miss for a number of months. This has been going on for two, three years. Uh, he's worried about the look of things. He certainly feels that everything is dissatisfactory from a functional and cosmetic point of view, and he's otherwise fit and well. So in your practice, you refer to a colleague with a specialist interest. You'd give the gentleman into cavernosal injections and see how he gets on. You'd use a penile implant with modeling, penile implant with grafting, or a penile implant with sliding technique. Oh. So I think, again, this reflects how uh, perhaps as a section we need to interact with the general urologists in the UK um, and how we can support each other really. The patients obviously when they have a more complex deformity need a more, um, a bigger armatorium of tools to be able to treat that. Some of the evidence around that, so implant modeling's been around since Steve Wilson uh, and, and prior to that really, um, but gained uh, fame through his fingers in Arkansas. Um, and recently over the last 12 to 24 months, some updates on, on its effectiveness. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a difference between the devices you implant and how you model around them. Um, and the rare instances of I was always worried about urethral injury and uh, injuring the implant or glands necrosis seem very, very rare. Uh, infection rates seem the same. So it seems a, a very safe and effective way of straightening a penis over an implant. If we're looking at grafts, then there's autologous, uh, allograft, xenograft, synthetic, bioengineering. There is all pros and cons to the various uh, grafts you may want to use. Um, it uh, appears to be a, a surgeon preference as to how you uh, operate on these patients and what graft you want to use as to whether it lengthens your surgical time, increases morbidity. Um, they all seem to be relatively effective. SIS seems to have fallen out of favor due to recurrent scarring and retraction um, with um, a, a dubious uh, longer term benefits. So I think the optimal graft is still out there to be sourced, it needs to be cheap needs to be readily available and it needs to replicate Tunica albuginea, which none of these do. The latest thing is Zenform, which is used for vaginal prolapse surgery. Um, and the benefits they would suggest is it's uh, less rigid. Uh, it doesn't become encapsulated. Uh, it's not chemically cross-linked um, and it should become less palpable. We're also using Tacosil as a collagen fleece um, with implant surgeries as well. So there's some additional um, options for you if you're going to go down those routes. Um, and in essence, small numbers, but no severe complications in the early phase. So finally, with lengthening, we can do standard grafting. 
We can implant uh, with incision and no graft, uh, where you can actually incise into the graft, particularly on dorsal curvatures, and relay the newer vascular bundle over the top. You can implant with a graft, and the risk there was always thought to be secondary infections, uh, or you can use a sliding technique. And we'll just concentrate on this last couple of papers from the Roll um, and this multi-center study, which looked at um, the sliding technique, which essentially uses semi-circular incisions of the tunica to pull out and cause two defects, which are then grafted over an implant. And I think the take-home message from my uh, reading of this is that you have to be in a very high volume center doing a lot of this type of surgery. Um, and really, the patients you're going to be operated on will have to have very severe shortening. Um, and it's not something I've impl implemented into my practice yet. Predictors of a good outcome, nothing really in, in, the, in the literature, but stands to reason that surgeon experience, volume, your setup, and how you counsel patients will be important. So, to end, I find treating PD a waste of time. Difficult due to lack of experience or training, stressful due to patient factors. They can be a hard group to um, please, um, and uh, with high rates of depression, uh, these are other factors that we need to take on as an additional uh, clinical hat. Uh, interesting, but I have more important things to do. Uh, but ultimately, are there people out there who find this highly rewarding? For now. Well, I'm glad nobody thinks it's a waste of time. So that's good. Uh, I think there's a highly motivated section uh, who've come to this particular meeting, um, and, and hopefully these messages can go back to your colleagues. Um, and within our area, I know that we're linking with our uh, regional uh, centres so that everybody feels supported and these patients are getting their best, the best possible care. So in summary, the guidelines are the guidelines, but what's right for UK patients now, particularly now we're out of Europe and uh, what's going to happen to the NHS? Can we really afford uh, expensive therapies? Uh, pooling of the resources, we need to get our information sheets up to scratch, the national databases organised, share our experiences and share the burden of the psychological support uh, and use the experts who are uh, trained in those processes. We're awaiting proms and, and, and further bounce order and the Holy Grail is really restoring normality. At the moment, we don't do that, but um, perhaps in the next decade, and I can stand up here later in my career, and we might be nearer that goal. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Holly. <clears throat> very comprehensive overview of uh, Peronis. Um, so our final speaker, uh, Mr. Vijay Sanger from Christie Hospital in Manchester. And he's going to be, uh, well, he probably changed his talk over the last week, but it's really about future of andrology services in the NHS. Thank you very much, Vijay. Great. Thanks very much, Asif. Um, most of andrology that most of the people you do, do in this room is, is actually not part of um, specialised services. A lot of it will be funded by CCGs. I'm not going to be talking about that today. What I will be talking about is the funding of specialised andrology which for the purposes of this talk falls into the realms of penile cancer, a little bit of testicular cancer, um, penile implant surgery, surgical sperm retrieval, um, and uh, urethroplasty. So one thing you have to remember with specialized services, it's, it's not just urology um, that we do. It covers everything that's in the prescribed specialized manual, it also covers a host of other diseases, all from the realms of dialysis, genetic disorders, rare cancers, and other rare conditions. So the current budget for 15-16 was £14.6 billion. So that's actually a 6% increase from last year, and that's actually double the increase that the whole of the NHS got. But you'll see there on that slide that £2.7 billion of that actually goes to cancer, a similar amount goes to cancer drugs, and 63% of that budget actually only goes on 10 areas. So when it comes to andrology, it's quite a small um, piece of the pie, really. The current urology CRG, as many of you know, is active, but not 
officially up, up, up there uh, as it used to be. So over the last 12 to 18 months, people like Asif and myself and a few members from the section of Angiology and people external to that have been working on producing national policy for England, and so it doesn't include uh, other countries, it's only for NHS England. This is the kind of work processes that we've had to go through to produce these policies. I'm not going to go through this, but what you will see is that it does include looking at the evidence, um, building a policy that fits the evidence, and then trying to actually figure out whether it's cost effective or not. And that's actually the, the last point, that is actually the hardest part of it. So we've been working on these specifications over the last year. What I want, I'm not going to go through them in great detail, but I just thought I'd choose the, the main headline parts of, of those policies that I think would be pertinent to the audience here today. So if we look at penile cancer, the main parts of this policy, which are different to the, the, the last uh, specification that was out there, was that we've now asked for centralised pathology review, which some of you might think, well, surely we were doing that before, but it, in fact, wasn't part of, this, of the specification. It is now. Uh, reconstruction has come into that, and we don't mean full phalloplasty, but centres should be offering a, 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 an element of reconstruction for their patients. The other important part of this policy is that any centre that's doing this work does have to participate in national audit and collection of data for quality dashboards when they become available. So at the moment, I don't think there is a national audit for penile cancer. It's something that the section of angiology needs to think about seriously. With regards to testis cancer, the two new elements of this are the insertion of partial orchidectomy. So this is for people that might have um, small uh, testicular masses or small calcifications that need excising. We've suggested that these are discussed in the testis cancer MDT and that they should be incorporated into andrology practice. And again, national audits and quality dashboard uh, data collection is important for this specification as well. So for this, it would be the RPLND audit, which I'm not sure whether it's actually still functioning at the moment, but it's something perhaps BAUS need to, to look into again. Penile implant policy, um, what I've done here is that I've, I've listed what the inclusion criteria for this policy are. So it includes all patients that have end-stage erectile dysfunction for all etiologies, but they must have been through all the processes um, that we have in our uh, ED clinics with regards to trying other therapies. We also need to make sure that we risk assess them. So this looks at BMI, diabetic control, whether they're using other types of uh, steroids at all. And th these things we know actually do have an impact on the outcome uh, of penile implant surgery. The other important thing is that they should be part of an MDT, which should include an angiologist with an interest in penile implant surgery. And the specification does actually state that it should be done in implant centers. Um, and that those implant centres should be incorporated into a specification. Now, the difficulty with this is that we actually haven't been able to specify what an implant centre is. So this is actually a policy which is slightly different to a specification. What the spot policy allows us to do is it gives you guys the remit to um, talk to your patients, find the right ones that fit into the inclusion criteria and be able to offer them surgery. What it doesn't tell us is how that surgery should be undertaken and in what kind of premises it should be. And that's what a specification does. So it specifies how the service should run. Now, we can't do that until the policy is live. And this policy isn't live at the moment. So if it does become live, then it's something that the section and NHS England would need to look at. Surgical sperm retrieval. And I think this is probably a bit of a coup for urology, actually. I think ASIF and the, the, the team that did this for NHS England worked incredibly hard to, to get this sorted out. And many of us will know that a lot of this has been in the, in, within the realms of the angiologist that's been trained by the gynecology route. What we've been able to do here, uh, and it's uh, reasonably evidence-based, is that we've been able to move this in the direction of urology. Uh, and I think, I think Mark Speakman uh, if I can quote him, said that this was a, a big change, a big sea change for infertility practice. So what, do, what kind of patients are we able to do this on? So it's for azospermic patients that have to be diagnosed by a urologist with a specialist interest 
and that person has to be working with a HFEA unit. It includes pe people that have had uh, uh, or are expecting to have infertility due to surgery or chemotherapy, and there has to be a reasonable likelihood of success. The important thing here is that we need to be able to confirm that funding for their IVF or ICSI has already been confirmed. So there's no point in offering patients surgical sperm retrieval if they haven't been offered IVF treatment. So people that have obstructive causes are able to have PISA, MISA, TISA, and TZ. And for people that have non-obstructive azospermia, it's micro-TZ. You can also offer micro -TZ for patients that have had, that fallen into the top category where they've had failed pre previous procedures. There are exclusions in this, and as you'd expect, um, those people that have AZ, F, A, and B deletions are excluded. Pre people that have had previous vasectomy that have obstructive azospermia are excluded. Uh, and those that have had coagulopathies, uncorrected, undescended testis, and untreated hypogonadism. But again, I draw you to the important points that this has to be part of an MDT and it has to uh, incorporate HFEA audits. Urethroplasty was probably, we started off this being quite contentious actually, but we, we realised that from a political point of view, um, if we push this in one direction, we might end up in a bit of trouble. So it's probably the, the simplest policy that we've got. Um, it basically states that patients with urethral strictures um, who've been discussed on an MDT um, are allowed to have urethroplasties. Um, it also includes recurrent patients. It states the EAU guidelines as how the service should be set up. And it also states that these, again, should be done in highly specialized centers, but we haven't been able to quote what that actually means. So once, again, once this policy becomes live, we'll be able to write a specification on it. We've also stated in this that anybody that's doing urethroplasties has to provide data for the BAUS audit and should be members of the uh, BAUS section and also the UK Urethral Surgeons Group. So in summary, the cancer specifications have been relatively straightforward and they're aligned and they're actually going through the processes. The, the difficulty we have is with the benign elements. So there's a certain amount of this is, that, is about whether the policy um, gets put through the system. So there is always a small chance, given the current situation that we have within the NHS England, that they turn around and make a decision not to fund these. They're just as likely to say, actually, we are going to fund them. What the answer to the question is, uh, I don't actually know at this moment in time. But I think we have to, to keep an open mind about the fact that people that make these decisions do have policies such as robotic partial nephrectomy aligned alongside penile implant surgery and a decision then has to be made about what's going to happen. So it's not an easy one to make. I think if all these policies do go through, it will be important for the section to work with NHS England to try and build the specifications that are fair uh, and incorporate as many people's views as possible. But I personally think that will result in a certain amount of centralisation. And I would say, and I think that most of the panel would agree with me, that we're kind of uh, within the realms of centralising some of this specialised andrology already. So what do we need to wait for? Again, we need to wait for the powers that be uh, high up in the uh, ranks of NHS England to decide whether these policies become active. Um, and then the big decision for us is how we're going to write the specifications. I will leave you with that last sentence. So a successful clinical policy needs funding resource which is beyond the, the CRG's control. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, VJ. And that rounds up the Androgy Update session. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers for some excellent talks and hopefully this has uh, filled you in with where we are with Androgy Service here in, in the UK.